In this video, we will conclude our review and discussion of the American writer Everett Dean Martin's 1926 book, The Meaning of a Liberal Education. Primarily, the book can be condensed down to a single idea and a single question. If we are to understand what a liberal education is, we should first ask who or what is an educated man? And what does it mean to be educated? After first outlining to the reader what is not a liberal education, Martin then assesses history, compiles a wealth of detailed information, and narrows liberal education down to three concepts, three traditions, or three schools of thought, devoting a single chapter to each of the concepts. The first chapter is devoted to classicism, then humanism or early modernism, and finally science, strict rationalism, hypermodernity or the irreligious world we associate with today. This is important because to be properly liberally educated, you have to have a strong understanding of the pros and cons of each tradition and must view them in a broad holistic sense not necessarily being a devotee of either school of thought unless you wish to specialize further. But as a bare minimum, or more so the expectation, because few will reach it, you have to at least have knowledge of the concepts and then be able to navigate and appreciate all three schools of thought effectively. Martin concludes the book by concluding his search for what the educated man is which is a well-rounded hybrid of the three traditions that he outlines. This is why for the purposes of a coherent overview, it is sensible to make a single video to discuss the traditions in combination with each other, rather than make separate videos on each school of thought, but then struggle to tie them together in a cohesive manner. That way you could just watch this video as the only video necessary to get a grasp of the book, because it will address his main question directly. Use this as an overview, and if you enjoy it, you're welcome to watch my other earlier videos on the book for further context on some specific ideas. The first of the three concepts that Martin outlines, and thus the first chapter in question, pertains to classicism. The three central tenets of the classical tradition are, firstly, Socrates, who is associated with the notion of critical thinking and intelligence. Secondly, Plato, who is associated with nobility of spirit, transcendental concepts, and early idealism. And lastly, Aristotle, who is associated with moderation and sanity. The second chapter in question introduces humanism or early modernism a worldview that attaches prime importance to human or earthly matters rather than strictly adhering to matters of the divine and supernatural. This cultural movement of humanism turned away from medieval scholasticism, which was a narrow-minded insistence on traditional doctrines aligned with the rigidity and objectivity of the classical tradition. Humanism acted as a critique of the Renaissance, which was responsible for revived interest in classicism, which encapsulates all ancient Greco-Roman thought and practices. Martin introduces the reader to the first key figure of humanism, which he identifies as the Dutch philosopher and scholar Erasmus. The author speaks glowingly of Erasmus and makes note of his skillful use of humour, stating he was quite effective at pointing out hypocrisy in strict moral earnestness and the ridiculousness of always treating life and its conflicts with an excess of seriousness. Perhaps it would be reasonable to suggest that Erasmus could be viewed as a Renaissance version of the Greek cynic Diogenes. As an early proponent of satire, Erasmus poked fun at the seriousness of the classical tradition. He also freely chose to take somewhat of a pacifist position against the conflict between Catholicism and Protestantism, which underpinned the Reformation, deliberately standing outside of it and dispassionately observing it to a large degree. 
He is best known for his 16th century work in praise of folly, and is considered one of the early forefathers of the liberal arts, as well as playing a role in planting the seeds of modernity as we know it. The second figure of humanism that Martin introduces is the French philosopher Michel de Montaigne. As somewhat of a free thinker, I would surely have aspects of Erasmus and Montaigne in my own character. As a skilled writer and wordsmith, I really felt the author's description of the Frenchman as similar to myself. Montaigne was obviously a genius, and I am not. But for all his talent, he was never pompous, and was very wise, but also acutely aware of his flaws. He wrote not for fame, fortune, or to change the world, which he chose to observe and detach from anyway, but he wrote to express himself, just as I do the same, so that his family, friends, and those who read his work can truly understand who he felt he really was. Of course, to some degree, he vouched for his sceptical, relaxed, yet educated way of life to become more commonplace because he saw the ignorance on both sides of the Reformation conflict and thus in conflict itself. Clearly, both Montaigne and Erasmus were true individuals, not beholden to religious dogma, but also not arrogant enough to denounce metaphysics entirely, become fiercely sceptical, and declare intellectual omnipotence. Aspects of Montaigne's life are quite amazing. What a mind he must have had. Studying at a prep school college at the age of six, and university at 13. He graduated at 20 years of age and was appointed as a councillor of Bordeaux's parliament and was eventually mayor of Bordeaux. However, he was a recluse and spent much of his free time alone in his castle library and even banned his wife and others from entering it. Montaigne is the one who popularised the essay because he was obviously very well read and intelligent but also refreshingly casual and modest in his style, with observations about all number of topics, many of which the common man could relate to. It's probably why even when reading the Shakespearean English translations of passages of Montaigne's work with typical formal and romantic language, the points he wishes to make are still well articulated and easy to decipher for someone with a decent working knowledge of language. Despite the fact that Montaigne didn't care to be widely known and considered a common and simple life to be virtuous, it is a shame that in the modern day the vast majority of people now know virtually nothing about these great men of culture and others like them. Whilst comparatively, I know far more than the average person on topics such as this, to my way of thinking, up until now, I've only dabbled in learning about the great men of the past, yet I'm already convinced of their monumental value, and I consider them worth knowing simply by the fact that they've written lots of work, and whether I consider it amazing or not, credit should be paid where it's due for the effort alone. So I have to have the humility to admit my ignorance and admit that they know more about life and about the world than I do. I feel indebted to them, but I recognize that it's a treat and a blessing to be able to read their work and gain even a fraction of their knowledge and wisdom. It is very humbling to me because I know that there is so much that I still haven't read, but it does excite my mind to think of what more I could learn and potentially gain. However, very few people seem to think like that now, or at least recognize that they do. As we can now assess the third and final tradition of liberal education pertaining to science and the world as we know it today, Martin draws our attention to the key figure of Thomas Henry Huxley, the English biologist and anthropologist, often referred to as Darwin's bulldog for his staunch advocacy of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. There is a common fear that a liberal education may give us the type of mind that is permanently sceptical and unable to decide upon anything, thereby making it ineffective. But Martin offers up Huxley as an example of someone who can alleviate such fear. Martin says, The educated man 
may not perhaps take sides on the ever recurrent question of who is to profit at another's expense, nor easily give his devotion to any particular utopian scheme of social reorganization, which happens to be the fashion of the reformers of his day. But if the educated man is like Huxley, he will be alert enough when he finds that intellectual integrity and cultural progress are at stake. Huxley was a champion of science, and argued for science to have a place in classical education. Not to supplant cultural tradition or classical education, yet coordinate with it. Although Huxley was an evolutionist, and clearly sees that human intelligence is part of the behaviour of an organism, which is itself a cross-section, as it were, of a process of nature, he did hold the view that morality and truth are absolute and eternal principles, which exist outside the process and constitute the very basis of existence. Reason, which knows these eternal principles and in which they exist, must then also exist outside the process, thereby arguing for the metaphysical concept of transcendental reason. But if we advance beyond Huxley, we could argue that reason is a function of the behaviour of an animal. The body of scientific knowledge which we possess is the revelation of the true nature of the facts which we experience. It is the intellectual equivalent of reality and is constantly updated. It appears that Huxley was more religious than first thought. He was agnostic, but not completely irreligious and materialist like a modern-day scientist. It would be safe to suggest that in Huxley's view, the promotion of science in education is worthwhile, not so that man can become his own god, but so that man can gain insight into God's laws. Fundamentally, the book seemingly boils down to existentialism. Education is a means through which one can gain knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and perceptions of truth, be they objective or subjective, to thus gain a greater sense of security in an insecure world. Science provides security to the non-religious, and God provides security to the religious. But as we should know, they are both forms of faith, deemed essential and necessary to their respective proponents. The search for the educated man is thus the search for the secure man, and education provides security because it provides answers to the many questions and happenings of the world. The true uneducated mind is thus left more ignorant, unenlightened, and ultimately more fearful of life than the educated mind. But becoming educated is difficult, challenging, scary, and laborious, albeit rewarding. Hence, it's easier, more superficially fun, and psychologically safer to remain ignorant or uneducated. However, what is initially comfortable may become eventually boring and ultimately dull if you are able to gain awareness. So Socrates, Plato and Aristotle in the classical tradition, Erasmus and Montaigne in the humanist tradition, Huxley in the scientific tradition, and the author Martin in his effort to compile the necessary and worthwhile information, each challenge man or the reader and place the onus on him to take responsibility for his own existential security in the form of cultivating a broad-minded adult education. Thus, the search for security has always been the goal of man throughout history, and different thinkers have put forth different methods of security which serve or have served their purpose for a time. Hence, coming to terms with this, helps me to see that everyone is just as insecure as each other, but insecure in different ways, either materially insecure or immaterially insecure. Some may be more materially secure than me, but they haven't, don't, or can't understand or articulate themselves psychologically like I can. So in many ways, I may well be more psychologically aware or potentially secure than they are, because I know myself better and have bothered to think. So the value that I can add is in encouraging others to also think. Teach others to be more secure in the area that you feel most secure yourself. 
Whilst we ought to want to try and educate as many people as possible, some level of reasonable discrimination is necessary. Education and the pursuit of knowledge is not democratic. It is not the domain of everyone. Simply because there are plenty of people who are perfectly happy in their ignorance and don't seek knowledge or even see themselves as ignorant in the first place, whether or not that is a fact. They can't be bothered to learn the material or don't have the capacity to learn the material, no matter how simplified we try and make it. But to their credit, it is doubtless that they know particular and valuable things that they themselves can teach others. In the realm of education, you cannot and should not force an adult to listen to the lessons you are trying to teach. They must become intrigued and listen of their own accord if they are to truly learn. The tree of knowledge gives us many answers to our questions in the form of fruit, but we can never be sure whether we will like the fruit until we taste it. Those who seek knowledge just have adventurous palates. Such is my passion for the topics I discuss that I've started a Patreon and now most recently an Odyssey channel because I know that passion won't fade. So if you enjoyed the video or find my analysis and insight valuable, please consider liking the videos, subscribing to the channel or showing some support and join the discussions of upcoming video essay topics and future book reviews. Your recommendations would be welcome. I will eventually post channel updates regularly on there and will give you some insight into the next books or ideas that will be used for content. I also plan to eventually create a Rumble and Subscribestar account, so come back to the channel and keep your eyes open for that. Follow the links in the video description below or on the channel about page under links. Thank you very much for the feedback and support you've shown thus far.